Hello on person this is Anton and today we're going to be discussing something that you most likely have somewhere at home in one of your medicine cabinets. But also something that's become a kind of a viral story in the news because of some of the announcements from the US government. We're going to be discussing this molecule right here known as acetaminophen, globally known as paracetamol and in US known as Tylenol, the over-the-counter painkiller that you can usually find in most pharmacies and that for many decades was used by pregnant women as it was considered to be the only source of pain relief. But in recent years, this pill has become somewhat controversial and started making quite a few headlines, mostly because of various alarming headlines that link the use of Tylenol during pregnancy with the increased risk for neurodevelopmental disorders, specifically autism and ADHD. But much more recently, and specifically in the last few days, this whole story went viral because of the announcements from Donald Trump where he essentially linked Tylenol and also the use of vaccines to a dramatic increase in autism over the years. But here's the thing, I'm really going to keep this super apolitical and try to avoid any controversy, because here I kind of want to do a deep dive into various studies and into the data behind this, looking at some of the evidence that was basically used by Trump and his agencies, but really avoiding any kind of a political noise and any kind of a potential bias. Mostly because, first of all, not American, but second of all, because there's actually a lot of misconceptions about Tylenol in general, and so this is a perfect opportunity to cover all of this. And so my goal here is purely informational. We're here to understand the facts, and most importantly, the limits of current knowledge. And actually, let's start with something super important. Let's start with Tylenol itself, because it turns out that, as a painkiller, it's really not that great. And so before we discuss the potential risks during pregnancy, let's discuss Tylenol or acetaminophen, because by itself this might be just a fundamentally flawed and potentially dangerous medicine, which is actually not at all related to what was claimed in regards to the pregnancy risks. And actually, if you want to learn some of the details about this, check out one of the previous videos by Rebecca Watson, also known as the Skeptic, who discusses all of this and all of the relevant studies in one of her videos in the description. But in essence, when it comes to any kind of an ache or any kind of a pain you might experience, the efficacy of acetaminophen is kind of questionable. So, for example, when it comes to the most famous cause, headaches, or I guess technically tension headaches, at least one comprehensive review discovered that only about 10 out of 100 people saw any benefit of taking Tylenol as opposed to a simple placebo. Or just to rephrase this, when researchers tried to administer Tylenol for headaches, only 10% of people had any effect. Which by itself makes this a ridiculously low number. And for things like, for example, back pain or arthritis, even at very high daily doses up to about 4 grams, this drug seems to be completely ineffective. And honestly, having taken Tylenol before for very similar problems, I would have to agree, it doesn't seem to do anything when it comes to pain relief at all, especially when you're aware of it, suggesting that maybe if there is a pain relief, it's possibly just a placebo effect. Then, for conditions like post-operative pain, Tylenol is described as being the least effective drug in existence. So basically here, by taking just a sugar pill, you'll get just as much benefit as taking Tylenol. Yet, there is something really important about this drug that is often forgotten. Forgotten because it used to be on every single poster produced by FDA for many, many years. Yet somehow these posters disappeared. Tylenol is also linked to a lot of serious health risks. Nothing to do with pregnancy, by the way, once again. We're not discussing this yet. Here we're talking about increased mortality and increased heart problems that have been associated with consumption of Tylenol. On top of this, Tylenol is notorious for being super damaging to liver. As a matter of fact, anybody who used Tylenol daily had at least four times more likely chance to show extremely abnormal liver function results compared to anyone who does not take Tylenol. There are a lot of studies out there exploring the link between liver damage and consumption of Tylenol. And by itself, calling this a safe drug is a little bit misleading, because every single year, at least 500 Americans die from accidental overdose by Tylenol. And at least 50,000 emergency room visits are usually because someone took too much Tylenol due to some kind of a pain or possibly a headache. Which actually brings us to the next part about Tylenol that most people are not aware of. When it comes to pain medicine, this drug is extremely low on what's known as TI or therapeutic index. Here, TI refers to the ratio between the effective dose, or basically what makes you feel better, and the toxic dose, which usually leads to overdose, or the dose that basically can hurt you. 
and turns out that acetaminophen is the only medicine out there whose GI is just extremely low and extremely close to the toxic dose. So essentially, if you're having a headache and you take three times as much Tylenol as you should be taking, you've already reached the toxic dose and will probably need to go to a hospital. And that is a huge problem for something that's basically sold over the counter without any prescription. Which brings us to, I guess, the main question and the main controversy. If it is so unsafe, why is this the only drug that's prescribed during pregnancy? So why Tylenol and why nothing else? Well, it turns out that for pregnant women, at the moment this is the only pharmacological choice that does not seem to affect fetus as much. And that's because a lot of other known drugs, such as ibuprofen or aspirin, are directly associated with fetal problems, such as fetal kidney impairment, that other pain medicines seem to cause. Moreover, a lot of pain during pregnancy or untreated high fever can technically pose significant risks to fetus, including preterm birth or even problems with the brain development, depending on the causes and the pains. And so in this case, it's usually seen as a kind of a necessary risk calculation, which is why most doctors still prescribe Tylenol, despite all of the stuff I just mentioned. And based on a lot of different studies, global estimates suggest that over 50% of all pregnant women use Tylenol at some point during pregnancy. For US and Canada, it might be even a little bit higher at 62%. But most women use it very briefly, usually less than 10 days, with only 18% using it for more than 20 days. And here, this is maybe a little bit important because, in most cases, when it is used for longer than 20 days, this usually has a direct connection with some kind of a pre-existing condition, and sometimes even depression and anxiety. This will be very important very soon. I believe this is what's called foreshadowing. But then we have the other side of the discussion. The statistics in regards to rates of autism in the last few decades, and the apparent increase in neurodevelopmental disorders based on several reports. And this is something that was reported by CDC back in May of 2025. But in essence, it's kind of based on the statistics that you can actually find in some of the studies. If you look at the dates here, and if you basically compare reports from a few years back compared to a few decades back, it does start to appear like autism is slowly becoming more prevalent and seems to be way more common compared to what it was like back in early 2000s. So here it went from 1 in 150 children to just 1 in 31 over approximately two decades. And so we do actually have several recent studies that try to investigate what's really happening here and if there's any connection between these neurodevelopmental disorders and the use of Tylenol or acetaminophen. Or just to rephrase this, if there's actually some kind of a direct link between the use of Tylenol and the sudden dramatic increase in autism. So this is not just some kind of a claim by Trump, this is technically based on numerous epidemiological studies, but specifically one systematic review that involved 46 different studies, with 27 discovering a positive association. That study, along with everything else, is in the description below. And so the overall conclusion from this particular study was that there seemed to be evidence that supports some kind of an association, but not a causative association yet. And that's because many of these studies discovered measurable differences. For example, in one of the studies, scientists discovered children whose mothers took acetaminophen and that had Tylenol metabolites present in their plasma had approximately 3.15 times higher likelihood of some kind of an ADHD diagnosis with this association appearing a little bit stronger with the longer duration of use. With the other study behind me discovering that use of Tylenol during the second or third trimester was also associated with much poorer early language outcomes, such as, for example, poorer vocabulary in children of the same age. And this was particularly pronounced in male children that were exposed to Tylenol in late pregnancy. And studies that provide this positive association explaining this as Tylenol very likely crossing the placenta and then reaching the fetus itself with the metabolism of Tylenol then leading to oxidative stress and endocrine disruption. Or basically leading to a lot of different effects that might interfere with fetal brain development. But once again, this was only discovered in half of the studies. Despite these strong associations and potential explanations using biological mechanisms, in every single study, the scientific community behind these studies emphasized one thing. This was not a causal relationship yet. There was no definitive proof that this was a cause and effect relationship, with the biggest problem in this case being what's known as confounding, or basically some kind of a third factor that potentially distorts the relationship and produces these effects. Which brings us to the side note I mentioned a few minutes ago. So imagine a pregnant person that requires Tylenol because they have a severe migraine or some kind of a chronic condition involving pain, which is usually the case for a lot of women taking Tylenol for over 20 days during pregnancy. 
And so the reason for this chronic pain is technically a confounding factor. And so the underlying reason for taking a drug, headache, infection or chronic pain might actually be the real reason that contributes to the child's risk of autism and not the Tylenol itself. So just to rephrase this, something is definitely going on in terms of health in these women and it's possibly causing increased risk of neurodevelopmental disorders. And so it's because of this pain that they then take Tylenol, making all of this correlated in the process. And so these underlying conditions and parental health status, like for example having some kind of a psychiatric condition or even a high risk for autism, seems to be just more common for women that use acetaminophen. And this was kind of proven in one of the recent studies from Sweden. In this 2025 study you can find in the description, Researchers used a sophisticated method by using what's known as the sibling control design and actually used 2.5 million children in this massive Swedish report. And in their initial analysis, they did discover very small risks associated with the Tylenol exposure and the risk for autism and ADHD. But when they performed a very strict sibling comparison, basically comparing an exposed child to their unexposed sibling, which controlled for all shared genetic and environmental family factors, this association completely disappeared as if there was basically nothing there. Which was a very important suggestion that the initial risks that were first discovered in the general population were most likely the result of some kind of a shared familial factor and not the drug itself. Because in this case, the autism or ADHD affected both siblings independent of the use of Tylenol. And that was a really important indication that this is a correlation, not a causation, with the actual risk potentially being something entirely different. But obviously here the debate is not finished yet. Despite the study here, even here we can make certain criticisms. For example, in comparison to the American studies, only 7.5% of all women in the study use Tylenol. But in the US, as I mentioned, this is usually about 62%. Suggesting the results here are still not perfect. Which actually leaves us with, I guess, two major schools of thought. On the one hand, we have at least 26 studies based on somewhat crude population cohort that often discover some kind of a link between acetaminophen and neurological disorders. But then we have pretty much as many studies that either find nothing or studies that control for genetics and seem to discover links that are more genetic and familial and not related to Tylenol at all. And it's this complexity that underscores why we cannot simply state that this is a cause and effect relationship. Right now there's just not enough evidence and so right now nobody actually knows what the answer is. And on top of this we also have some additional biases that are usually ignored in the media and something that's also important to mention. Because here apart from these neurodevelopmental studies we also have to remember what changed in the last two decades. And so maybe there is another reason why suddenly we seem to have so many more children diagnosed with autism compared to early 2000s. And this can definitely not be attributed to the increase in Tylenol use at all. As a matter of fact, if we look at the statistics, one of the major US studies reported that the use of Tylenol by pregnant women has actually been slightly declining from the peak in 2009 when it was at 70% down to 58% in 2018. Yet despite of this, as you can see from these numbers, the rate of autism still increased. And so this massive increase can potentially be attributed to the overall expanding diagnostic criteria. Or I guess just to rephrase this, there is now a greater public awareness of autism that officially began sometimes in the 1980s. And there are a lot more tests and diagnostic tools allowing for more children to be identified compared to decades before. As a matter of fact, in 2013, the famous psychiatric diagnosis tool known as DSM officially released its fifth edition. And this edition dramatically refined diagnostic criteria for a lot of autistic disorders, essentially creating what's known as a unified spectrum. And so for example here, the Asperger syndrome, the pervasive developmental disorder, and a few other things were now unified under an umbrella known as autism. And so even though back in 2012, 2011, someone could have received a diagnosis of Asperger's, by 2014 this would just be autism which partially explains what we're seeing here. It's extremely unlikely that the dramatic increase here was the result of sudden use of Tylenol, which as we know from studies decreased over time, but instead this seems to be the result of changes in the diagnostic tools. And so since the rates of autism continue to increase, but the Tylenol use seems to decrease, this strongly suggests that acetaminophen is not the singular driving force behind the dramatic increase in neurodevelopmental disorders. Okay, having said all that, so I guess what's the conclusion? Well the conclusion is that Tylenol still kind of sucks. As a drug it has a very limited efficacy 
and potentially doesn't even treat most pains. Yet despite of this, it can also be relatively toxic and dangerous, especially in slightly higher doses. And it's especially dangerous for a liver. Something that we used to be warned about all the time, but I guess over the years, the policy has changed. But when it comes to the main topic, pregnancy, currently the FDA and most medical bodies still recommend it as the first line of defense. And that's because the risk posed by alternative medicines or by having extremely high fever that's untreated or possibly a lot of pain is actually still more dangerous for pregnant women compared to using Tylenol. And though we do have some studies that suggest an association between the use of Tylenol and some kind of a neurodevelopmental problem, at the moment there's definitely no cause and effect and studies involving familial genetics seem to suggest that there is something else going on in the end. But despite all of this, in the end, Tylenol still kind of sucks. Just because of its extremely high toxicity and because its pain relief efficacy is very low, if you do have an alternative, just take an alternative. And though as a fever medicine it's still actually pretty good, for pain I would definitely avoid it. But as I mentioned, the video by Rebecca Watson explains this in a lot of detail. And so on that note, that's pretty much all I wanted to mention. If there are some additional studies that discover something else exciting, we'll come back and discuss this more, but I'm definitely going to try to avoid getting into politics about this, just because at the moment there's really no scientific consensus. Anyway, thank you for watching, subscribe, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon where you can find additional videos, videos without any ads and can DM me directly, or by joining the channel membership that grants you early access. Alternatively, you can also buy the wonderful person t-shirt in the description below. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.